Uh, and in fact, after I was arrested a couple times with Ammon and Dorothy, he counseled me that perhaps I should not hang around so much and be identified with these folks because maybe I could be more effective in Catholic dialogue about peace by working within the more established and accepted institutions of the official Catholic Church. And frankly, I did not heed that advice very well. Uh, my real spiritual guides were Dr. Day and Adam Henderson. Uh, but in 1958, just before I graduated from college, I had some options open to me. Uh, and uh, Dan, who was then teaching religion at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, Jesuit College, invited me to come to Syracuse when I graduated to become a volunteer staff person for a little slum settlement house that he wanted to start to engage his students in work with the poor. And I agreed to go and be the staff person. But shortly after, he wrote to me that the plan had fallen through without giving much explanation. And it was not until 1987 when his autobiography, To Dwell in Peace, came out that I found out why the plan had fallen through. He devotes two pages to the story. On advice from the more experienced Jesuit colleagues at uh, Le Moyne, he had informed the ordinary bishop of Syracuse of his plan. And he says that to cover himself and for safety's sake, he ventured to drop the information that this very idealistic young man, who happened to be a pacifist and had even served jail time with Dorothy Day, had generously volunteered to staff the project without pay. He says this letter raised, quote, holy hell, unquote. The bishop called him, reamed him out for 20 minutes for suggesting that he might foist such a pacifist on the Diocese of Syracuse. Said that Berrigan himself, you claim to be a spiritual director, you yourself need a, you're the one who needs a spiritual director. Uh, and then later uh, called the president of Le Moyne College uh, to agitate that Berrigan himself should be sent away from Syracuse, uh, but the president didn't go along with that and buried and stayed for a few more years later. I did not meet Daniel's brother Philip until 1963 when they visited me briefly in Chicago after my wedding. And I never knew Philip well. But according to Francine Duplessis Gray, in a 1970 New Yorker profile about the Berrigans, a friend uh, that she interviewed uh, described Philip as, quote, an exceptionally gifted warrior, unquote, as a field, in a field artillery battalion in France and Germany in World War II, and then uh, switching to the infantry where he was commissioned as a second lieutenant. I do not know when Philip began to see himself as a pacifist, but it was not until 1967 uh, that he sprang into action with the first draft board raid uh, uh, in Baltimore that led to the Plowshares Movement. And it was only uh, in 62, 1962 when Daniel dedicated his fifth published book, The World for Wedding Ring, to uh, Dorothy Day, Tony Walsh, Carl Meyer, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers. And it was the mid-60s, uh, maybe 63, 64, when he began to speak out publicly against uh, nuclear weapons and the Vietnam War and participated in the creation of the Catholic Peace Fellowship. And it was Philip, but it was Philip who drew him into radicalism. And it was not until 1968 with the burning of 1A draft files at Catonsville, Maryland, in which he participated, that he wrote to me that he had definitely burned his bridges to a respectable institutional pathwork in the framework of the church. <laughs> 
So, so under our very feet at that time, in that explosive time, elements of the American Catholic Church were undergoing a profound change on issues of pacifism, war, and peace. And this was somewhat facilitated by, of course, a John the Twenty Third and Pacem and Terrace and John the Twenty Third's great influence on peace and on reconciliation with uh, Eastern Europe and, and communism. Now I think that I can promise you that you can talk to any American Catholic, any person in this room. Uh, active for peace from a nonviolent or pacifist perspective today, and you will find a person who was influenced to nonviolence by Dorothy Day personally, directly, <coughs> or influenced by someone of a later generation who, in their turn, was influenced by Dorothy Day personally. In other words, all the leaves all the twigs, all the branches of the tree of American Catholic pacifism and peace movement go back to roots in Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker movement. And now, today, the most radical and determined action to reject all war and violence is organized and led by Catholic lay people and clergy. Whether it be Sister Megan Rice, Greg Borchi, Michael Wally, just sentenced to years in prison for their action at the Oak Ridge plant against nuclear weapons. Or my dear friend and former wife, Kathy Kelly, three times nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for her nonviolent work and peacemaking work in Iraq. Palestine, Bosnia, Haiti, and Afghanistan. She is currently working with young Afghan peace volunteers and just came back Monday this week from escorting two young Afghan women to a conference and training on Gandhian nonviolence in Ahmedabad, India, where Gandhi did much of his work. Or we could speak of Father Roy Bourgeois, who lived with us at the Catholic Worker in Chicago in 79 and 1980 after he was kicked out of Bolivia, uh, who coordinates the School of America's Watch at Fort Benning, Georgia. Or Father Louis Vitali, Jesuit, and, and uh, at uh, the Nevada Desert Witness nuclear weapons site in the Nevada desert, or the New York Catholic workers who organize uh, witness against torture to protest these outrageous uh, imprisonments of people for 12 years without trial at Guantanamo, or Father Frank Cordero and friends who protest, and Frank has been in jail, I don't know how many times, five, six, seven times, six month sentences for protests outside the Strategic Command Headquarters, Stratcom in Omaha, Nebraska. I could go on for many more. These are my friends, and I can tell you that every one of them and many of their thousands of associated activists can trace their peace activism straight back to the Catholic worker in Dorothy Day, who recognized way back in the 1930s that total abolition of war is the overriding ethical challenge of our time, and that it is inextricably and intimately bound to these other great challenges, overcoming destitution and poverty, so much of a world's wealth wasted on militarism and war, and to the other challenge of preserving the biological and ecological health and integrity of our sacred Mother Earth. And as 
one of the speakers of the workshop yesterday, Peter Marn, and we, Peter Marn recognized this, that we have to have a different way of living and relating to the land and to the biological resources. It was Dorothy and the Catholic workers who framed this question and this great challenge to American Catholics 80 years ago in 1933 and to me over half a century ago. Now I want to move toward a conclusion by addressing a question that is interesting, though quite peripheral to this huge contribution that Dorothy made to the evolution of the American Catholic community on this great moral issue of abolishing war, a moral issue at our time like the issue of the abolition of slavery <coughs> a century and a half. Should Dorothy be canonized as a recognized saint? Did Dorothy or would Dorothy reject the idea of being canonized? So Dorothy would be disturbed at the idea of a couple hundred thousand dollars being spent on this. And I'm kind of disturbed about it too. But, uh, <laughs> but there are some people in our movement who argue that Dorothy explicitly rejected the idea of being canonized or being called a saint, and felt that this would be a way of dismissing or marginalizing her radical ideas. On the face of it, on the face of some of Dorothy's own statements, these folks may seem to be correct. But I don't buy these arguments for a minute or even a fraction. You know, I'm very opinionated, you can see that. <laughs> in the first place, we need her in the church as a recognized model and mentor for both personalism and charity in service to others and for this huge moral issue of abolishing war for all time in our time. And in the second place, the Dorothy I know was almost obsessed with the lives of the saints. She prayed for mercy and justice through the examples of the saints. Every day she tried to storm heaven through the intercession of canonized saints. You know, to suggest that she would not be thrilled to be placed at the table among them and recognized in their company just seems ridiculous to me. Uh, she might be too modest to say it, but... <laughs> <laughs> the Dorothy I knew was not a humble woman. <laughs> now, Father Larry Mosebaugh, who some of you know, all am I, uh, killed several years ago in the hills of Guatemala, I was a Catholic worker saint that I knew well was a humble man, he was. But Dorothy was a very proud woman and a very assertive woman. Now to be a recognized Catholic saint, one is supposed to have the virtue of humility, or at least appear to be humble. <laughs> and Dorothy so wanted to be a real saint, as distinct from an officially recognized saint, we know some of the officially recognized saints went to grave. <laughs> uh, but she struggled continually against her pride and against any tendency to vanity. And tried to model the true humility and genuine holiness that she saw in her mentor, Peter Martin. Whereas, you can see from my talk today, Anne and Hennessy and I never even struggled against our pride or vanity. <laughs> <laughs> never striving to be saints or recognize saints, though trying very hard to be people of justice in all our relationships with humanity and earth. And speaking of saints, and many of you, I suppose, are, I know now, are academics and scholars. 
Uh, many books and articles have now been written about Dorothy Day. Sometimes I wonder how much more can be said. So I want to turn your attention briefly to another great peacemaker and saint of our time, descending in direct line from legacy of Dorothy Day. It has been my incredible privilege and pride to be so closely associated with these two among many others of our outstanding peacemakers that I have known. First, as a disciple and follower of Dorothy Day for so many years, and then starting in the year of Dorothy's death as partner, husband for 15 years, mentor myself and friend to Kathy Kelly of Voices for Creative Nonviolence, a real saint, a person of incredible patience, strength, gentleness, and courage, a person who has been directly and personally engaged in international peacemaking missions for the last 29 years in Nicaragua, Iraq, Palestine, Bosnia, Haiti, Gaza, and Afghanistan. Always reaching out to listen to the voices of ordinary people in the realities of great privation, suffering, and danger. Death, privation, suffering, danger. And to bring their stories back to us if we have but ears to hear. And Martha has been with her to Afghanistan. Chris so and um, uh, um, what's his name? <laughs> Names. Uh, <laughs> I've been with her to Bosnia. I don't know which others of you have been with countries. In projects that she organized. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, she's just back this week from spending some time with her young Afghan peace volunteers working to create a core of nonviolent youth in uh, Afghanistan, in Kabul, and in India. So listen to her account of their stories. This is the, this is the thing for us to do today, <laughs> you know, to help Kathy to bring these stories and spread them throughout the country. Uh, and you can find all that on uh, www.bcnv.org. Right now there's a journal of these young women in India. Uh, these are two young Afghan women. And now for some concluding words that I will take directly from Dorothy Day. Parenthetically, it is very unfortunate to me that in justice movements today, the signature quotation cited for Dorothy Day is, quote, our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system, unquote. That quotation is not characteristic of Dorothy's voice, as I heard it and read so many times. And according to Brian Torrell, another friend and disciple of ours in Dorothy, writing in the National Catholic Reporter for April 16, 2012, uh, Brian had done considerable research on the issue, and he says that Dorothy hated this quotation. And it probably is not an accurate quotation at all, uh, but is a paraphrase by a reporter who interviewed uh, Dorothy for the February 18, 1970 profile in NCR. In contrast, for me, the most characteristic words in her own voice as I heard them were, we have to put up with others the way God puts up with us. <laughs> Our system the American cultural system, the capitalist economic system, the American Catholic religious system are not filthy rotten systems. They are imperfect systems, a mixture of good and bad, 
in many ways often selfish, corrupt, and cruel, particularly the capitalist and cultural system. There was a time when the Catholic religious system was cruel with the Inquisitions and so on too, when they had the power to do it. Uh, but in other ways, these systems are practical and decent, working for the good, the common good. And that is the way I think that Dorothy saw them. Our problems don't stem from the acceptance of these systems. We must accept them. We have to accept them. Because we do not of ourselves have the means of the power to change them decisively. And the distinctive Catholic worker philosophy that Peter and Dorothy taught us is the philosophy and practice of personal responsibility. Our problem, our personal challenge in the classic formula of 19th century socialism, that formula that so much influenced Dorothy and Ammon, is to quote, build a new society within the shell of the old. And so I will close with the voice of Dorothy herself from the very last page, the concluding postscript of the long loneliness, her autobiography. And you'll see that last page reproduced in Claudia's display over here. And I'll read it to you. And someone quoted from it yesterday, but I'll read the whole of that postscript. just sitting there talking when Peter Martin came in. We were just sitting there talking when lines of people began to form saying, we need bread. We could not say, go be thou filled. If there were six small loaves and a few fishes, we had to divide them. There was always bread. We were just sitting there talking, and people moved in on us. But those who can take it, take it. Some moved out, and that made room for more. And somehow the walls expanded. We were just sitting there talking, and someone said, let's all go live on a farm. It was as casual as all that, I often think. It just came about. It just happened. I found myself a barren woman, the joyful mother of children. It is not always easy to be joyful, to keep in mind the duty of delight. The most significant thing about the Catholic worker is poverty, some say. The most significant thing is uh, community, others say. We are not alone anymore. But the final word is love. At times has been, in the words of Father Zosma, a harsh and dreadful thing. And our very faith in love has been tried through fire. We cannot love God unless we love each other. And to love, we must know each other. We know him 
in the breaking of bread. And we know each other in the breaking of bread. And we are not alone anymore. Heaven is a banquet. And life is a banquet. Too. Even with a crust where there is companionship. We have all known the long loneliness and we have learned that the only solution is love and that love comes with community it all happened while we sat there talking and it is still going on these are the words that first spoke to me so powerfully. 59 years ago, when I was 17, a very shy and lonely boy, meeting them at a table in the huge main reading room of the New York Public Library at Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street in New York. Dorothy and Anna and seven others were just sitting there talking two years later when I got up the courage and I walked in to join them at the Catholic Burger Box. Kathy Kelly was just sitting there talking with the young people of Acting and Peace Volunteers in a very cold apartment in Kabul a few days ago. And we are sitting here listening and talking and we'll soon go over for lunch and try to know each other better and to know Dorothy better in the breaking. 